Hello everyone and welcome to today's session, Methodology for Testing Forensic Hypothesis and Finding Truth. I'm Seema Singh and I will be your host for the day. Our speaker for this session today is Jessica Hyde, Director of Forensics, Magnet Forensics, Adjunct Professor from George Mason University. Please note, the session will be in listen-only mood and will last for only 40 minutes, out of which last 10 minutes will be dedicated to the question and answer session. So requesting all the participants to post your questions in the question and answer chat box. Should you need any assistance during the session, please use the chat box. The criteria for certificate of attendance is one, the participant need to attend the complete webinar. Two, fill in the survey form and write with the right answer to the three questions based on the webinar provided by the speaker, which will be sent to you one day post the webinar. About a speaker, Jessica Hyde is an experienced forensic examiner in both the commercial and government sectors. She is currently the director of forensics at Magnet Forensics and a professor teaching mobile forensics in the graduate program at George Mason University, where she achieved an MS in computer forensics. Jessica is the host of Cash Up, a weekly podcast where she interviews digital forensic practitioners. She is also involved in several community efforts, including as chair of DFIR, Review, first vice president of the New York Metro High Tech Crime International Association chapter, advisory board for Cyber Sleuths Lab, and a member of the editorial board for the Forensic Science International Digital Investigations Journal. Her previous roles included performing forensic examinations as a senior mobile exploitation analyst for basis technology senior at EY and senior electrical engineer at American Systems. Jessica is also proud to be a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Without any further delay, I would now hand over the session to Jessica. Thank you so much, Seema, and thank you so much everyone for joining us. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a methodology that I developed for years uh, working in the lab as to how to find truth and test your hypotheses in digital forensics. And the methodology really has five major steps. We're going to talk about the discover phase, the test phase, and that's really where we're going to spend most of our time today. We're going to talk about all five phases of this methodology, but we're really going to focus on testing, uh, finding the data, parsing that data, and then scripting and sharing that data. So the first question to ask yourself is, why would you test? Well, as digital forensics examiners, there are a lot of questions that we have to answer. And time is very valuable. So we need to use our tools, our forensic toolkits, to get some of the data very, very quickly. But the tools are not going to support everything. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But more importantly, you may have a lack of data. And you may want to understand, why is there a lack of data? Why am I not seeing use of an application I expected? Why was the device not where I thought it would be? So you may be trying to understand why you don't have what you expect based on other elements in the case. You also, if you have your smoking gun, that, that element of a case that's really important, you want to be able to validate your results. And there's a lot of changes that happen in the community of tools, operating systems, even firmware, that can cause changes to what we expect. And a common thing that I sometimes hear when I start talking about the importance of using this methodology, discover, test, find, parse, and script, and share, is that I have lots of tools at my disposal. Um, maybe you have every commercial tool on the market, all of the open source tools, you have an unlimited budget. But at the end of the day, maybe there are a thousand mobile applications, for example, that are supported by commercial tools. But if you look here as far as what's on the App Store, just between Google Play and the Apple App Store, um, we're talking over four million, five million apps. There, are, it's not even just the quantity, there are new apps constantly daily, and even the apps that are supported by tools, they're consistently updated. 
And even when a vendor is responding to that update, building in that support for that change takes time. I know um, one week that I had been working on um, data from Facebook Messenger, the schema changed three times in one week to the point where I was building new parsers three times in one week for the same application. Um, and nefarious actors may be using an app intentionally that's not supported. Or maybe you have to prove something that was not used, or there were anti-forensics or time stomping that was utilized in your case, and you need to be able to prove by testing that that artifact has been altered. Regardless of if your tool found the data or not or supports it, you still need to find it as a digital forensics examiner, regardless of what environment you're working in. And when you do find that piece of information, you don't want to solely rely for that specific item, um, you need to validate it. So that when to test, again, examiner's time is extremely valuable. That's why tools are so critical to have to bring those insights to us quickly. But the actual item that you may be testifying to in court or basing your report on those artifacts, you want to validate that evidence. You want to validate any assumptions you're making, any hypothesis about what you're doing. When we're dealing with digital forensics evidence, our job is to find truth in data. And in order to find that truth, we need to be able to validate. And in order to validate, we need to not just make assumptions based on what we see in evidence, but to test. And we'll talk about a couple of potentially wrong, dangerous assumptions that I've seen in evidence on cases I've worked. And that time is extremely valuable. So we need to focus on things and we need to focus on the proper time frames to determine when we're going to test. Okay, so why is it necessary? You need to be able to verify what you think is happening is happening. You need to be able to ensure that you truly understand the data storage. And when you test, you can actually use known data. That's gonna help you decode and prevent you from making assumptions. With hypotheses, we need to prove them. So let's get out of this and just start walking through the methodology. Okay, so I'm going to do this walkthrough of the five steps, discover, test, find, parse, script, and share, um, focusing in this example uh, with mobile, with a mobile application, but please note that this crosses into all realms. Uh, this, will, this methodology, I've used it in network testing and hardware testing. Um, I've used this methodology for Windows, Mac, Linux. Anytime you're looking at how changes happen to a system, this is a methodology that will help you in that process. So in the discover phase, what you're going to do is you need to look at what was installed. So you're, you're discovering, you're starting on your evidence, right? The first thing you're going to want is either a physical or a file system image. Um, and again, this example is with mobile, but the important thing is, is that you have all of the data. If you just have a logical image in mobile forensics, your receiving data is already interpreted by the operating system of the applications that allow themselves to be interpreted and presented in that way, for example, via backup. If you have a full physical or a file system image, you're going to have access to the data that is not already included. So the purpose of this step is to identify the things you're looking for. Now, if you're looking at applications, it would be looking at the installed applications. Um, if you're looking at events in a particular time period, you would be narrowing your evidence down to artifacts that took place in that time period and then exploring what was used there. So one of the first things I do is look at what the commercial tools found because I need that head start. So I'm gonna utilize all my commercial tools. And then I'm gonna look at what's installed, what application permissions there are and what's been used to determine what apps or events may be of interest and then see if there is supporting content that parses that. So in this example, um, I have an image and the what we're looking for is chat data. Um, I ran this through every mobile forensics tool uh, that's on the market. I believe I used eight tools and none of them parsed any chat, chat content um, for this particular data set. So 
because we're looking at Android, there, there are different locations depending on what um, operating system you're looking at. But on Android, here are a list of different areas where you can look to identify what applications are installed, as well as what application usage has been most current and is common. Now, I will state uh, that com.vending.android can have some extraneous data from the uh, user that might have been on another device. So I just want to give that caveat. So on this particular image, uh, I went ahead and went to the packages.list, which literally in Android is just going to give you a listing of the different applications. And we can see that we have a whole bunch of games installed in here. So I don't know who's a fan of Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes or of Clash of Clans, but they are all installed here. And then the next thing you're going to want to do to get an understanding of an app is I like to look at the permissions. So it's the packages.xml file. Uh, there are preference files per application as well. But this one lets me see all of them at once. And I can look for things that might be of interest, such as access to contacts, because maybe that shows me that that application is able to chat. Maybe I'm looking for things that have access to geolocation data services. Maybe I'm looking for things that have access to the camera, video, et cetera, for whatever data type I'm looking for. In our example, we're looking for chat communications. Um, I would also say that if you're on different um, operating systems, this is going to be a different place. For example, in iOS, uh, you'll be looking at the TCCDB for this. Uh, on a Chromebook, you would be looking at the extension preferences file. So what we found on here is that we have three apps of interest that appear to have communications, even though none of our forensics tools parsed it. And that's Chess with Friends, Word Chums, and Quiz Up. So the first thing I do once I've done that as part of my discovery phase, I now know what applications I'm looking at in my discovery phase. I'm going to go ahead and see if somebody else has written a parser for this or something similar. So if I look for um, chess with friends, there aren't any parsers, but there is a parser for words with friends. Uh, and they were both made by Zynga. This was done by Cheeky Forensics Monkey. And when I went and looked at the application, the database was exactly the same name. So went ahead and just tried the parser and voila, um, his parser was able to parse. And we can see that Frankie Blue Eyes and Elvis P74 are communicating with each other. And we'll talk a little bit about development of profiles in a minute when we get to testing. So now we've got two apps of interest that we're going to look into, Warchums and QuizUp. So as part of our discover phase, we're going to research the apps. This is really important. A lot of times folks will research what is written about the app, but that doesn't necessarily tell you all of the functionality. A lot of the functionality is left out. So for example, with Wordchums, there is nothing in the description that talks about the fact that there is a chat feature. With Clash of Clans, funny story, you can't get to chat until you have, I believe it's a level for town hall. So I had to create uh, data for Clash of Clans and get to the chat feature exposed. And I was creating data with my child um, because nothing better than using your children to help you with data generation. <laughs> and in creating that data, he told me I was playing wrong because he didn't understand that my objective was just to get to town force, level, townhouse level or town level four, whatever it was so that I could, could chat. So sometimes those things can be funny. But this chat function is noted because there's a chat button in a picture that's on the details of that. So look at the pictures. I will also say that I've noted functionality uh, from reading um, the actual reviews of the app, additional functionality, so that it would become part of my test plan. Now, I actually patient is about. So for testing, there's a couple of really, really, really key elements. The first thing is, is you need to look at if you're going to be able to test on physical hardware on a device, if that's available to you or emulators. And the key things I want to say you keep in mind is the same operating system version, the same app version, potentially even the same hardware. In terms of app versions, in the existence of um, uh, an Android APK or an executable that you're testing from Windows, um, or another file system, if you can extract that from the image and test with that in your test environment, that is critical. Um, in terms of if you're going to be on hardware or emulators, uh, take into consideration um, 
any if you are happen to be looking at something that might be malware obviously the preference would be to be in a virtualized environment and a segmented network then you really want to document your test plan document your data population and test the application so let's talk a little bit more about this so where do you start so if you're looking at physical hardware, I wanted to share some great blogs and posts that describe physical hardware setups that you can use that will help you be successful. Um, one of the key things is what device am I going to be able to use to test in order to be able to pull back the full file system image? Um, Chris Vance did a great blog post on this for Android and iOS uh, on his blog D20 Forensics. Uh, Biz Barney did a great blog post uh, on uh, the Mac Forensics blog about setting up an iOS device using a Mac for testing. And then if you're looking at computer hardware, Elon Wright or Diverdifa, she has a completely amazing uh, post about how to set up Windows, Linux, et cetera, in your hardware environment. However, Emulation can be key. A lot of times I test an emulation because it might even be quicker and easier for me to spin up emulation. For Android, great blog post by Alexis Brignoni. Now his blog post is actually featured on looking at data uh, and presenting it uh, in this way, but it can also be used for extraction. For Android emulation, there's lots of choices. I mean, for VMs, you may be thinking of different VM companies where you can create VMs for computers, uh, for Windows. For Mac, one of the cool things is for about a month now, you've been able to spin up Macs in the Amazon cloud in AWS, and that can be great for testing. I've actually been doing some of that for a CTF we were building. Um, and then for Android, and I saw, I believe Kevin Pagano is here, so he already probably took that hint for the CTF that I'm building. Uh, the Magnet um, has an app simulator that you can use to, to simulate data, but really for Android, Knox, BlueStacks, JennyMotion, you can use any of those emulators for iOS, I haven't played with it yet. Uh, typically, I test iOS on physical hardware, especially now with all the jailbreaks that allow for full file system acquisitions. But Corellium does exist, and that may be an option for you as they now have personal licenses as opposed to corporate licenses that make it a little more economically feasible. So in this particular example, I chose to test with some Nexus 7s I had. Uh, I do prefer Nexus and Pixels because they're, they run like completely the rawest Android since uh, compared to if I was using a Samsung device or something else when I test. Uh, but if I'm testing specifically for how something acts on Samsung, obviously I'll use a Samsung. I actually have a Samsung test device I'm using here uh, for something else. So creating and building those profiles. So it's really important that your profile actors who you're doing the test data with are not you and do not know real people. This allows for the shareability of data later. I always create a population plan of who I'm using. I record the data for each profile. You definitely need at least two people to communicate with each other. And it's even greater if you have a partner. I'm working on some stuff right now with Sarah Hayes and Nicole Odom, where we're doing some testing um, on a physical hardware device. And we've got three different characters that are working together. Um, but the important thing is to document. Now, I record my data actually in a password manager. I use KeePass because my KBDX file allows me to create multiple users for multiple profiles. But you can just do it on a document like this. Now, please note, uh, Frankie S's Gmail account and password and Facebook account and password have been changed and the security questions are obviously not shown here. Um, so how do you create those test data? Now, I was kind of joking in the data I created for this presentation in it being two dead musicians. But from a common point, uh, I use a lot of sites. I use fakenamegenerator.com, which I love because not only does it give you names and addresses, it gives you socials, it gives you credit card numbers, it gives you security question answers, it gives you everything you could potentially want. So if you just save that data, you know it's completely fictitious. You can actually pick which country, which language set for the name. So you could pick uh, Canada and a Hispanic name. You can pick anywhere in the world and make that combination for your uh, character. 
one of the things I also like to do is make sure that my profile pictures are not stock images uh, and are not real people. And the reason I don't use stock images is because they actually are real people, even if they're stock images. So what I tend to do is use this person does not exist.com, which actually uses AI to create fake images. And then I use, I save those pictures and then use those with other um, random pictures that are do not have faces um, to populate uh, the photo aspects of profiles. And again, I like using a password manager to store all of my different people because I can store them separately. Now, rules about profiles, absolutely necessary. So number one, Profiles should only talk to other profiles. Do not communicate with other people. If you are communicating with others, there's actually a little DFIR circle of trust on mobile data creation where we all have SIM profiles that can communicate with each other. And this actually came out of a Twitter conversation. I was like, hey, I'm tired of speaking to myself and having those SIMs talk to other SIMs. And we even share some character information because some of those SIMs may be in age ranges where we want to make sure that the data creation and the conversations match the styles and lifestyles of the other characters. But the important thing is not to connect with people you know in real life or even other sims that connect to people in real life because then you're going to get requests and connections uh, from applications as they propagate that pertain to real people. And we want to try to keep real people out of our data. And you do need to associate a lot of these things and use them regularly. So like Facebook is really prolific at pulling down fake profiles. So you actually have to work really hard to, to maintain them. <laughs> Um, this sounds like the silliest thing to say, but I worked in a lab where, where I came across this, where people were flipping their own SIM in to create test data. Now, creating test data, I typically go and purchase a SIM in cash from a, um, can, uh, from a convenience store. Uh, they're usually about $35 a month in the U.S. for unlimited, so it's, it's really not a big deal. The bigger issue is if you um, need to test on a Verizon carrier, et cetera, they also have to-go plans. So please use a non-real SIM. Um, I typically create a ProtonMail uh, account for anonymity and then use that for all my follow-on crea account creation because you do not need to associate uh, a phone number. And then I try to create evidence um, outside of my home location. This has become more difficult in the time of COVID. But what do you do if you already kind of know the format and you're just trying to talk to somebody else and share the data, but you can't share their data in evidence? I, I think thank Mike Williamson for turning me on to these two sites, uh, Makaroo.com and GenerateData.com. These allow you to take schemas that you already know or are seeing in your data set and go ahead and populate them, uh, JSON, CSV, SQL, Excel formats, and then you can use that to demonstrate to somebody else what the data set looks like. Okay, so you've got your profile created. Next, you really need to start your pre-planning. So you've done all that research about the application and the feature, so you want to document and write out an actual test plan, action by action, of what you're going to be doing. Hopefully, you've borrowed the APK or the executable or the DMG from the original evidence and sideloaded it into the device so you knew you were working on the same uh, version. I would also say operating systems and dot versions are really important. This can get really difficult when you're in the world of iOS, for example, where rolling back is uh, not always a it's something you can do, and it can be very costly to maintain every version of Apple devices on every single piece of hardware. So in terms of how you then document your test plan, you need to write a script of what you intend to do and then follow it. This is going to save you time and documentation and contemporaneous notes are absolutely critical so that you know exactly what action you took at what moment so you can understand the artifacts left behind. I did forget to mention one thing, which is I typically make a baseline image of the device before I start populating it. And one of the reasons I do this is so that I can diff that to the current um, state of the device after I've populated the data. So then when I take those actions, any files that are created, files that are changed, I'll be able to see that difference. 
I always also perform my actions one minute apart. You're working with things you don't know or things you're testing, right? So even if you're testing what makes a link file appear, which was just tested last week, I learned about that from uh, the Digital Forensics Discord server. Someone shared that they had done that, uh, formed it a different way. By performing actions one full minute apart, what you're going to allow for is your data to be discernible regardless of the precision that the data timestamp is formed in. Um, and this is an area where actually you can have missed data. So for example, um, iOS did an update to their SMS messages where they used to store the data milliseconds at a millisecond precision. And it was an epoch time based on number of milliseconds. They did an update where they increased the precision to nanoseconds on the back end. Where, and this is another reason you need to test, if you looked at that database and used a tool that did not yet recognize that update, it would have not registered the timestamps or incorrectly reported the timestamps on all newer messages, but your data would have looked correct because the date timestamps on the older messages from when it was in millisecond based epoch would have still shown. So I tend to do one minute apart because most applications are nanoseconds, milliseconds, single seconds, um, two second precision if you're dealing with like Blackberry, two byte, two date time code stamp. Um, and so I tend to do one minute apart because I can distinctly see that. And I have worked with applications where it uses multiple timestamps and they have different levels of precision throughout the application's data storage. You also wanna document each action and it's way easier if you already have the script and then you're just annotating on the script when you did it. I screen cap everything. With mobile, I oftentimes will just videotape all of, uh, take a video camera and record everything I'm doing. With um, PCs, for example, I use an application called GreenShot because I can set uh, a hotkey to take a picture of a specified area, so maybe just my VM window, and go ahead and save it to a designated uh, folder location with one hotkey. So, now you've set up all your test data. Now you have to find, find where all that data is. Now I did give you guys a clue before. If you've made a original test uh, image, an image of your test device before you started testing, you can use a tool like Beyond Compare to go ahead and look at the two file systems and see which folders had changes to them, what files were written that was new, because now you need to look for databases that pertain to that application based on your data set. Another key for Android and iOS actually is um, the package name, how you find out what the package name uh, that's going to be in that folder path is called. If you go to the Play Store and look at the URL bar while you're on that application, you are actually going to see in that URL bar uh, the package name, com. Uh, well, we'll talk about the one here in a second, com.quizup. Core. And so then I can go to any files that are com.quizup.core and start looking for the files within them, viewing them to find out what was in of interest. Um, so you want to look at all the files in the path. Sometimes that can get tedious. There can be many, many subfiles, but you need to find things like keys, things like data. You can go ahead and search for things like chat and message. I know a lot of people do that, but that's not going to necessarily help you. And then when you come across a file, you want to look at it in some kind of preview um, to see what, if it is potentially content of interest. So this file, which has no extension, <laughs> uh, just a dot of extension, appears to have data of interest. I can see that content there. And so by manually looking through this, I have chat history and conversations. Now, the reason none of the commercial tools picked up these applications, these gaming applications, is none of them, uh, they weren't supported and they weren't using common things like plists or SQLite databases or even now very common level DBs to store that data. Instead, it's in proprietary formats. So this is what that cache history file looks like. And I identified two files of interest, cache chat history and cache conversations, followed by uh, a, a probably an epoch timestamp looking at that. So if we look at word chums, 
uh, we're going to find that in the com.people.peoplefund.wordchums, which is its package name, a whole bunch of files there, uh, chat one, friend two, game one, user one, and all of those files need to be correlated in order to build the message content. It's important also to note that just because we found com.peoplefundwordchums here, which I believe is in data data slash data, that doesn't mean that there isn't additional data in another location like com.media0 uh, slash com.peoplefund.wordchums and then a whole nother set of file. Commonly what you'll sometimes find is you may find the data here in the data data folder and there are different locations depending on which operating system you're on but if you jump to the media and then user number zero slash and then that same um, find a path that contains the same package name that is where you might find multimedia pictures videos etc that are going to be referenced from other databases or storage areas I want to share a really big pitfall about assumptions here. So I was working a case that actually contained QuizUp a long time ago. And in QuizUp, in the QuizUp contacts was a whole bunch of usernames and pictures from all over the world. It gave me their city, it gave me their username, and it gave me their avatar, which many times was a real picture that may have been of them or who they wanted to present as, right? And it would have been a really bad assumption, and this is why we test, to go, these must be contacts of my investigation of the user on this device. So then I tested QuizUp. And in my testing of QuizUp, uh, the older version of QuizUp, not QuizUp 2020, this has changed. In regular QuizUp, when you go to play a random game instead of against someone you know, it spins a globe. And as the globe spins, a person um, you get about 10 matches from all over the world. So I'm in the United States. It might show me somebody in Western Canada, somebody in Russia, somebody in China, someone in Australia, someone in India, somebody in Norway, and somebody in the UK. And it spins the globe and then randomly matches me against them. All those people who you were never even matched with or never played a game with are put in your contacts. This is why it is incredibly important to not make assumptions about data based on what table names are or what things are parsed as and to ensure that you test and validate what makes something appear. Because if you went off that assumption, you may assume that somebody is pertained or has a relationship with someone in your case and they don't. Okay, so the next step, you have your data, you're going to need to actually parse it. So this is where we actually get into the data and turn it into something human readable. So the first thing you're gonna do is use a viewer if it's appropriate. Um, I showed you something with a preview there, but you may have to look at what your file extension is or your magic header and find something that supports viewing that data, be it a SQLite database, a level DB, be it just XML or raw text. We're looking at some of this data here in Notepad++. You may have to correlate different tables. Your goal is to decode this to human readable. You want to take all that encoded data, like time date stamps, and convert it so people can understand it. And then finally, once you've decoded the data from your test scenario, you want to then apply the same methodology to your evidence, whatever it is, how you parsed it to, to the evidence, right? Because we've created this test data based on the situation in our evidence. So because we're talking about chat in this example, let's talk about some of the fields and things you want to make sure that you're looking for. You want to look for sender and receiver, but sometimes it might just be one field. The sender and receiver, it just might be other party. And then the direction may be what determines if it's a sender or a receiver. Now, the direction would refer to um, outgoing or incoming, but sometimes not even outgoing or incoming is stated. Sometimes that has to be denoted based on the status because your status might be red. If it's red, I know it's incoming. And then I know that that phone number is the person who sent it. So you might have to derive based on what how your data is formatted and shared. Um, but don't forget to look for attachments. 
messages and geolocation test with these things and you know and one other thing i'm going to share about an application i was once testing i was once testing a common chat application for a case i was working and i was trying to figure out the data and what was important was that i took an ios device and an android device and use them both to create test data and the reason is the applications had different features at that time right things are constantly being developed so the ios device allowed for um location data to be shared uh location pins and the uh android did not i was curious in android but what happened if an ios user sent that android data if i just tested android to android i wouldn't know um Additionally, in that same regard, uh, if you look at older versions of WhatsApp, because the data was so different, the in, if the data was encrypted or not, depended on if it was sent Android to, to uh, iOS, iOS to iOS, Android to Android. If they were mixed, they had trouble with the encryption, but if they were the same, they didn't. So there's really fascinating things there in terms of some lessons learned. I call this my sometimes list because it's just things I want you to be aware of. Sometimes it's going to be just a SQLite database or a known database, and you'll be able to view the data and make sense of it, especially with the knowns you have from having done your testing portion. Sometimes there's an open source parser for the database type you're seeing. So I don't mean like we were talking about with Cheeky Forensics Monkey having a parser for a like tool before. I mean, sometimes there's an open source parser for dealing with something like a level DB. Um, but sometimes it's going to be a dot dat file with proprietary formatting, which is what we're looking at. Sometimes you're going to have to multi bring multiple files together. Sometimes all the data is in one file and you're lucky. Sometimes parts of the data will be encoded and other parts won't. So you might have an encryption or encoded message field, but your time date stamp sender receiver might all be clear text. And so you might be able to get to some of the data more quickly than others. And some of those fields are just going to be really common. So let's parse some of this data. So here's the data from QuizUp, and I can look at that and see that it is pretty close to human readable, just a notepad plus plus. And literally, all I did to take this data and convert it to being human readable was I hit return a bunch of times. I did all this analysis in notepad plus plus and then reopened my save file in notepad. And you can clearly see um, the messages and that there's a message ID, a from player and a to player, actually the first um, lines of this file identified the from player and to player by their ID, and this is what you get from it. Now, the word chums data is in a proprietary dot dat file, and it is not as human readable. I see a lot of numbers, but I do see some regular base HTML encoding. So I'm going to start with what I know. The HTML encoding seems to make sense. And another point on testing is make sure you're testing all the features. This app allowed me to have multiple games. And here is my screenshot because I continually save them. And in having multiple games, what you can multi, multiple games going on, you can see that this message is not in this screenshot because it was in the other conversation. So now I was able to determine which of these numbers was the conversation ID. It also let me know if it's the numbers before or the numbers after that make the difference. So then when you start parsing it, I want to bring up one really important thing. You don't have to know what everything is. I still don't know what this number four is. But that's not important because I know, maybe it is, but I know what a bunch of other things that I care about are. So this first timestamp here is actually the timestamp of the last message received. This is really cool because it allows me when I write a parser to know when I'm done. <laughs> this here is the actual uh, last, a total number of messages that were saved. Then I have the game chat ID. Again, I was able to determine that by having multiple messages. And then we have the user ID. And obviously, I, we know from our known data which message sent which, so we know that. And then we have the Unix timestamp that the message was sent, and then the encoded message. So with that, the next step is to go ahead and script and share. So why are you going to script? Three major reasons. If you think you're ever going to see the app again, if it's too much data to parse by hand, um, I once worked in a, a chat app on a case and there were over 7,000 rows. If you think I was going to manually do that, no way. 
wrote a script. And then you want to be able to share with the community uh, to save someone else's hard work. Now, the most common scripting language that we're going to use in forensics, because it's what's compatible with most of the tools, is Python. And if you don't know Python, I highly recommend Alexis Brignoni did a free Python study group, and he posted all the videos. I think there's 11 of them online. Um, you get a textbook, you go ahead and do those walkthroughs with him, and you'll be on your way to writing Python scripts. So this is actually really kind of cool. Years ago, um, I worked with uh, Cesar Cazada. He and I worked in the same lab, and we worked on writing this methodology together. And um, so then when he got into Python scripting, I thought it was important to have him demonstrate here. So this is him running the script he wrote to go ahead and parse WordChum. So he's just going to his directory, and then he's going to call his parser, which he called WordFo. You've always got to come up with a clever name. And the first thing it's going to give you back is the last message and the number of chats, just that information, just so you know it ran. And then there's an output CSV. And you can see on this output CSV, the, ga the game number, the sender, the timestamp, the messages, and the record IDs. You'll also see that there are some emojis in here, important to test with emojis, as they are so common in language today. I did want to share that there's so many different ways that you can share. Please share what you found, be it the artifact you've discovered, the new way that something uh, can be created, that show bags can be created another way than we thought, then link files can be created another way that we want. There are so many things that can be tested. Please share what you test. This is a great way to break into the field and to become known, a known entity, and to help you get that next role. And there are so many different places you can share. I don't want you to be discouraged if you haven't broken new ground. You validating that something still works in a new version is valid and important research to share. You documenting how you learned something like this talk, which is a methodology about how to do this process, is valuable to share. And then you get to build your own playbook with the information you're documenting. There's lots of great uh, resources out there on how to share. I recently wrote a blog post on ways to share in DFIR. I encourage you to check that out. Uh, DFIR Review takes actual blog published research, so you don't have to go through the academic process to publish and get peer reviewed, and peer reviews that content. So check that out. You can share artifacts, scripts you write with the world on things like the Artifact Exchange or the Artifact Genome Project. I encourage you to start a blog. Great post from Phil Moore uh, on that on This Week in Forensics, which if you do write a blog, please share them with This Week in Forensics and DFIR.training so they can get out to the whole community. So in conclusion, please test your hypotheses when you're dealing with digital forensics. Don't make assumptions. And there is a methodology you can use regardless of what platform or what environment you're in. Discover, test, find, parse and then script and share so that the rest of the community can benefit. Thank you so much. Really excited to get to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. That was a really, a very, very informative and insightful presentation. And I hope it was the attendees, I mean, they have really enjoyed and it was really helpful and knowledgeable for them. Now, before we start the question and answer session, uh, there is a small announcement at EC Council. Encouraging women in cybersecurity to step up and come forward has always been a part of our mission. To further our initiative to spread awareness and help bridge the gender gap, we will be dedicating the month of March to celebrate our women leaders in this growing industry. Our hope is to have women leaders like Jessica help inspire other women to pursue a rewarding career in cybersecurity. So if you are interested to know more about our programs, you may take part in the poll that is going to be conducted now. So should we start the question and answer session, Jessica? I'd love it. That'd be great. We already have too many questions coming up. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, the first question here is, how safe is my real profile when a fake profile is created using my mobile device? So I advocate that you do not use your personal mobile device to create a fake profile. The data will commingle. Um, Google is very prolific and 
contacts and other information may become commingled. You definitely want to separate. Um, I highly advocate either using an emulator and creating all of your profiles in an emulator um, or getting a SIM card. They are reasonably affordable and populating either a physical device or a virtual device um, with a new phone number not associated with yourself. Great question. Thank you, Jessica. Another question is, for legal issues, how convenient is it to create fake profiles to carry out investigations to social networks? Ah, Adriana, that is a great question. Um, I there, a, there are people from all over the world here, and I am not an attorney. I do not advocate for using fake profiles to conduct social media investigations. Uh, the analysis I was speaking to here today is more for um, devices that have already been recovered, mobile phones, computers, network data, um, for social media investigations uh, where a specific user requires that the person be a friend with them in order to see a profile. For legal reasons, I suggest that you do not uh, use fake profiles to make contact with real people as part of an investigation. One of the key things uh, in my in the fake profiles is that they should only ever communicate with other fake profiles and no real people and should not be used uh, to, to access uh, or become friends with other social media investigation tools. I will say, um, where I would say that there maybe is a separation from this, is there are some, devi uh, some devices like Instagram, uh, for example, where you do need an account in order to even be able to look at public profile information. In the instance where you just need an account in order to view public profile information, I would check with your organization's uh, general counsel before doing it, but I think that that is less of an issue. It's when you're having any contact friending or friending a friend of a friend or any of that action that there's an issue. Uh, but if you're looking at public information just logged in as a user, probably less of an issue. I would say um, your better bet is to try to get a collection either from tokens that you've recovered from the account or with consent. Uh, there are archive systems of archive your own data. You can do warrant request services if you're legal uh, to any of these providers and get warrant returns. And there are commercial tools support as well as open source for support for parsing lots of those returns and self-archives. Thank you so much Jessica. Uh, I hope uh, she got the answer. The, <laughs> next question is, the next question is, will a video taken of actions performed as part of forensics be accepted as valid evidence in the court of law? Um, so you're asking about the video you take as you're um, proving your, um, your doing your testing or a video you're taking for manipulation of data. Um, so sometimes you can't get into the evidence device um, any way except for manually touching the buttons on the device. This should be your method of last resort. You should always try to use a forensically sound process, a commercial tool, a free tool to do an acquisition of the mobile device. If um, you are forced because of some kind of restraint to move to manually accessing the device, putting in the PIN code and manually looking at contents, that should 100% be done under video where every action and everything can be um, documented. And then again, the clear thing to do anytime you're working on evidence, and I know we were talking about testing, but anytime you're working on evidence is to document, document, document. Contemporaneous notes are absolutely critical and clear. There was actually a good post recently by Josh Brunty of Marshall University uh, around documentation. Um, and there's also a bit of hacks uh, dot com is a blog that has a good post on contemporaneous documentation. And if you're doing anything like that, I would 100% say document and video. Great question. Thank you, Jessica. Another question is, how can we go about doing forensics on the locked 
an unrooted Android device device given to us? Great question. So, you know, if you would have asked me three years ago, are you more likely to get um, full forensic analysis on an Android device or an iOS device, I would have said you're more likely to get a full file system on an Android and you're less likely uh, on an iOS. And that world has flipped um, because of exploits like Check Rain that work on anything up to the iPhone XR, depending on the, the version of iOS, but newer versions of iOS are supported. Um, the issue with Android devices is there's so many different answers. It really depends, and we need to talk about the exact device. There are methods that you can use, like um, custom recovery modes that will get you root on the device, that if you install a custom recovery with the device even being locked, you can, uh, custom recoveries have root by default and you can pull the data. There are bootloader methods of acquisition, uh, and there are commercial tools that support those, those can be very expensive. There are commercial tools available to law enforcement that do unlocking of advanced devices, including those by Grayshift, um, who does unlocking for some newer Android devices as well as iOS. There are methods um, that use things like EDL mode or emergency download mode to with a different um, a cable that adjusts some of the electrical components to put the device into an alternative mode that allows for a file system or physical acquisition. There are certain exploits that evolve just to MTK or Qualcomm chips that on certain devices allow you to interrupt some of those initial sequences and get data. Um, there are specific um, exploits that work only on Samsung and some on LG. So, so really it depends. It depends on exactly the make and model of device. I would say if something's not supported now and you have a full physical, in the modern day almost every device is encrypted. So warning number one, do not take the chip off. That's something we used to do back in the day, but post uh, Android 6 and full disk encryption, I do not advise that. You'll never get the data back. The most important thing to do if there is not a methodology to support that device today is to wait. Put that device, get a logical if you can, go to Android and get a takeout to Google and get a takeout if you can. The amount of data in a Google takeout is incredible. Tara Milton and I did a presentation, uh, you can pull it from the Magnet Forensics Resource Center, comparing the data on a Google takeout to an Android full file system. And the amount of data you can get from a takeout is so valuable. So if you can get user credentials and authority to go ahead and do a self-archive Google takeout, do it. If you can, serve a subpoena warrant to, to, to Google to get a warrant return, do that. There are other methods to, to get the data, even if there's a locked device that might be looking at the way that data is stored externally. But yeah, uh, I guess in response to your question in summation, it depends. <laughs> Excellent <Maybe> question. Just, <laughs> yeah, we have another interesting question. Uh, she asks, can you share some tips for testing when you don't have access to the physical devices? For example, when I don't have access to an Android phone or a Mac laptop, are, VM, are VMs and emulators a viable option? Absolutely. So um, I've been doing some testing uh, just this last month with emulation of Mac devices in the AWS environment. It's about a dollar an hour, so it's not too expensive if you can do quick things. It's actually the time to pull down the data that will, will kill you uh, because the data export is pretty slow. Uh, so I would do more targeted file acquisitions uh, with that. Um, and, you know, um, I actually was using our own tool magnet, Axiom Cyber, to do the acquisitions from the, from the Mac in the remote AWS environment. Um, but AWS having Mac emulation is excellent now because if you don't have a Mac in your testing lab, it allows you to test a Mac. Um, Android, I have been emulating Android for years. You can use Knox, you can use Genymotion, you can use BlueStacks, you can use the methodology, you can use the Android Studio SDK. The actual Android RAW has RAW images for Pixel 3, and I was working with some of that in the past week. So you can absolutely, I actually have a student who's doing some stuff uh, with that Pixel 3 emulation directly from Google on the Android SDK. So there are a slew of options. Check out that blog post that's in the deck. Um, uh, the deck will be available. I'll make sure to share it with EC Council in a PDF so that it can be shared. Uh, and please go to that URL and check out that post from Alexis.
I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, we will take another two questions. Uh, we have too many questions. Okay. Why not access the device's FPGA port and download the binaries even if encrypted? Right. Good question. So if you the raw binary if you have passcode and have the device unlocked and you can download the emulated partition uh, it will be unencrypted and it is valuable if you have the encrypted partition a lot of keys are now hardware derived keys um, you are probably not going to be able to un encrypt that. If you are solving that problem and want to share, uh, please, please, please share. Uh, but I would advocate for only um, extracting the raw binary from an emulated. Um, I 100% use DD command lines connected to devices that are um, rooted. If the device is rooted uh, and encrypted, that's great. You can absolutely take a rooted device. This particular Android happens to be rooted. I can it and I go ahead and just run a DD on the command line uh, with you know two uh, terminals. Uh, you push BuzzyBox and Super User over, you netcat across, and you bring the data right over to your computer. DD the um, the emulated unencrypted partition. So you can do that, um, but you might not always have a device that has an available route that allows you to do that. And if you're directly connecting, again, you need the device on and unlocked and emulated. Uh, when I was answering the prior question, I was referring to uh, a draw, uh, an image, a binary, the, the entire chip is full disk encrypted locked. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, we, have, we have come to the end of the session. We'll just take this one last question and then, then sure. we'll close. Yeah, the question is how does using proxy socks or other technique help to mask your data? Sure. I mean, if you're concerned about masking network data and your geolocation information, um, that can be very, very helpful. Um, however, location services, when you're testing, you want to have everything on. So if we're talking specifically about mobile, you want location services on. So using a proxy or a SOC, um, a, a VPN, it's not going to help you on a mobile data on a mobile device with the Google location services that are taking straight from the tower you're connecting to and um, and are taking data straight from your GPS antenna um, on an PC. Absolutely. You can use those things to disguise your location. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. I mean, I know we have a lot of questions which are still unanswered so we can collect them and send it across to you yeah Excellent. over the email yeah and thank you to the attendees who have taken part in the poll and uh, um, i really thank jessica for such a wonderful presentation uh, just before i close the session uh, i'll just repeat the criteria for certificate of attendance participant need to attend the whole webinar and fill in the survey form with the right answer to the three questions based on this webinar provided by jessica which will be sent to you after the webinar. So thank you, Jessica, once again, and thank you to all the attendees. It was a pleasure to have you with us. So I conclude the session now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.